Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muckrake Podcast. I'm Jared Yates Sexton. I'm here with Nick Houseman, who, your voice, what'd you say, 81%? Well, not the voice. I think the overall feeling uh, and how I'm doing is probably like 80, 81%. But yes, the voice, I think, is 100. Hey. You know, you know what, though, Nick? Your 80, 81% is better than most people's 100%. Okay, we'll find out. <laughs> well, and, and thank God you feel better because, um, you know, I, I don't know how you felt about it. It was like when we did the Weekender last week, it was like jam-packed. There was so much to talk about on the Weekender. I was like, man, I wonder what's going to happen when we do the Tuesday episode. And we, we got a humdinger of an episode here. We It's it's completely full. Well, you know what's uh, fascinating about this is that I think we're all sort of like Wolverine or uh, Deadpool, right? A little slower on the timeline, but we naturally heal. Things will heal. We just can't look at it like within 10 seconds and it just your arm just regrows. But still, it's like you're talking about you. You're not talking about democracy, correct? Oh, if, if only if only democracy had um, if only scale. democracy healed itself. And yeah. unfortunately, it does not. Uh, before we get in these headlines, everybody, a couple uh, uh, table setting things. One, we will be doing a live taping of the Weekender episode Thursday night, uh, March 7th, following the State of the Union by President Joe Biden. Uh, the State of the Union starts at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, he, he goes for about an hour, give or take. We're going to preview that speech in a little bit. Uh, so as soon as that's over, we'll be doing a live reaction and analysis show of the State of the Union, and that will be the Weekender. All you got to do, go over to patreon.com slash podcast. Get on there, talk to us, listen to us, ask questions. That'll be part of the show. It's a good time. Also, a reminder, it's March, Nick. And in we're taping this on the 4th of March. That means in 18 days on Friday, March 22nd, you and I are going to be in Henderson, Nevada, outside of Las Vegas for uh, Pete Dominic's stand up pod jam. Uh, I'm going to be doing a bourbon talk that Friday, March 22nd. We're going to be doing a live show Saturday, March 23rd. We're almost there. We're getting there. It's frightening. What is time? What, what, is, what is time, man? February went so fast. Uh, go into the show notes in order to get information on on going. We've already heard from people who are going. We're very excited. Very, very excited to hang out with each other, to hang out with you. Meanwhile, Nick, the Supreme Court of the United States of America, the highest court in the land, uh, man, they do not get tired of making headlines. They handed down a 9-0 to zero unanimous decision uh, against the state of Colorado dropping Donald Trump uh, from their ballots. They have ruled that that decision by the state of Colorado to drop to uh, Trump off the ballot was unconstitutional. Uh, they agreed that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment couldn't be used by the states. Five of the justices, the conservative justices, went even further and went on the record saying that only Congress can make this happen. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here in terms of the decision, the split between the justices, what they said in their opinions. Uh, what is your initial reaction, Nick? Well, you know, I think my initial reaction is that they kind of are saying that it's unenforceable, basically. Now, they, they want to focus on the fact that Congress needed to do, has to enforce this at all, but it doesn't say that in the Constitution. Now, the reason why we have a Supreme Court is to fill in the blanks among all the things the Constitution doesn't say. So this is why you get these like activist courts that get to just make up whatever they want. And on this one, and uh, by the way, precedent doesn't mean anything to them. Nothing. Always t they talk about stare decisis at all when they're getting confirmed, but it doesn't mean anything to them. It's simply no. a political uh, act uh, Act here. Um, but it's it's worrisome for a couple of different reasons. And part of it is it's like, well, if if he can't be taken off the uh, off the vote for being an insurrectionist and what where are we what what is the state of our democracy if it says it in the constitution and yet they're not going to make it enforceable it's interesting yeah uh, the, it, it is a fascinating decision and there's a lot to react to here first things first uh the supreme court was created to uh be, be the judiciary between the states in terms of disputes they gave themselves the power to decide what was constitutional and unconstitutional which is important to remember particularly when we're dealing with such a, a corrupted and stolen supreme court now which is that this was a an institution that was created to serve the interest of white wealthy men doing a hell of a job of it it really truly is um i i am of a few minds here First things first, Nick, I, I don't like the idea of states just being able to handle this. Like, I'm not a states' rights guy in general. I, I kind of think states' rights is just a code for uh, using white supremacist ideology and hiding it behind, you know, uh, dubious legal theories. I do not like the idea that certain states are just going to drop people from their ballots. Uh, 
Uh, I say this all the time. The last time that happened was prior to the Civil War in which Abraham Lincoln was dropped from the future would-be Confederate states. I, I don't like it. That being said, it is the Supreme Court's job, if they have given themselves this power, to be the ones to say whether or not a person who tried to overthrow the government of the United States of America should be allowed to run for the presidency. Here, they have decided that they are not. And do you know why they said that? Not because they don't want the power, because they don't want the responsibility. They've said that Congress has to be the, the body that enforces it. Is Congress going to throw Donald Trump off the ballot, Nick? Wait, well, can you, what's the threshold for Congress having to enforce this rule? Did you see that in Section 3? Go ahead. It's two-thirds majority of both houses, mm. which they know doesn't exist and will never exist. It will probably never exist again unless something really, really dramatic happens. So what they are saying at this point is that there is no way for this to be done. And and it's once more, it is the same thing that has happened in this logjam uh, uh, iteration of the United States government, which we talked about on the weekend or with Mitch McConnell. Thanks a lot, Mitchy. Bang up job you did here in creating this situation where Congress isn't going to get anything done. As a result, all of the protections that were put in the Constitution aren't going to work. And quite frankly, have never really worked to begin with. We didn't take care of the Confederates after they came back into the fold. We allowed them to come back and have power and, you know, uh, dance around. Thanks, Andrew Johnson. And now we have a situation where a person who tried to literally overthrow the government, uh, and we'll talk about this later, is currently the front runner for the presidency going into 2025. Right. And we have to remember what the order of operations is here. So the um, there was a, a compelling argument in the front of the Supreme Court of, the, of Colorado that proved mm -hmm. that he was an insurrectionist. Because remember, if you're going to take him off the ballot for being an insurrectionist, you have to prove that. Well, real, now, real fast, Nick, yeah. I, I listen, I am not a jurist. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I understand that the Muckrake podcast is not a court of law. Can I enter one piece of evidence uh, in, into the record for Donald Trump having led an insurrection? I'll allow it. I fucking watched it. <laughs> right. I watched it along saying. with millions of other Americans. I watched it in real right. time. So what, what almost seems, you know, because in theory, if you're going to follow the Constitution, what triggers taking him off the ballot or not allowing anyone to run who is already a sworn officer of the uh, of the country uh, uh, is is being an insurrectionist. So you mm. have to imagine, OK, maybe they're going to say he needed to be convicted in a federal court of being an insurrectionist. It just so happens, Jared, go figure. We're in the middle of that right now, but we can't get to that until they rule on another case, which is another, these are connected by the way. So the question is, are they signaling with this ruling here that basically is covering Trump from being an insurrectionist of the rest of the, the campaign? Are they signaling something about what they're gonna say about absolute immunity coming up? Uh, and that's another interesting case. Now they might, and here's my theory. My theory is that because this was all the, the liberal and conservative justices all agreed on a 9-0 decision, perhaps part of this calculation or the negotiation was that they're signaling they are going to not let him have absolute immunity. And that's why the other justices were willing, the liberals were willing to go along with this decision. Am I, am I uh, sounding crazy or not? You're not sounding crazy, but do you know what I hate? I hate that we're sitting here trying to to deign the signals that are being sent by powerful people behind closed doors. I feel like I'm back in freaking Greece talking about what Apollo or Dionysus wants from us. You know what I mean? This is not how a functional society is supposed to work. This isn't how a, a, a representative government, a democracy, a liberal democracy is supposed to work. This is so beyond the pale. And what you just said, Nick, I went with you and I think you have a point. And I also felt my brain shut off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like this stuff. That's the problem. The only thing is what's in the balance is our democracy and not like, you know, whether a, maybe a little law on the outskirts of things changes something. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I understand like how you can get into the weeds on this stuff and start to look at like the jurisprudence and all of that. But like when it really comes down to it, like this isn't what's supposed to happen. You right. know, you, 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 you try to overthrow the government. And guess what? That's like one of those places where, like, again, I'm not really into the death penalty, but we got things on the books, Nick. We, we you know, that that's how this stuff is. And you're exactly right. It goes back to the thing. I, I've, I've had phone calls 
with automated customer service lines that make more sense than that. <laughs> you know, like, well, I mean, if he's convicted, well, you, he can't be convicted until he does this. And then if he's convicted, you're telling me that I have to rely on Congress coming to do this? Like Mike Johnson, who needs to pray to the big man upstairs to put his pants on in the morning? Like that guy? And, 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 and the House Freedom Caucus has to somehow or another get on board with this thing? Nick, some of the people who would be voting on this tried to help him overthrow the government. It gets worse, Jared. Wait, gets, time out. How does it get worse than that? Well, I mean, here, here's the scenario that I think is interesting because let's just pretend they actually get all their ducks in a row. They, they April 22nd, they did the immunity. They, they deny it, which they should because it does not exist in the, in the Constitution. And Jack Smith gets his, his, um, his uh, case. He gets a guilty conviction of, of Trump being an insurrectionist. Right. Well, that should certainly allow the states to pull them off the ballot. Let's just say that happens in like September and they pull them off before Can't November. It. Can't do it now. They can't do it now because, by the way, remember the argument that the defense had by Trump's guys was that he wasn't an officer of the state. They were trying to parse language as to why it doesn't apply. They weren't even like denying that the, that the law exists and it should be a trigger. They're just trying to say, oh, he wasn't, wasn't really the people, the person that they're referring to. That didn't hold any water. But then for the Supreme Court to go above and beyond that question, to start weighing in on the fact that they're not going to find him uh, uh, taking off the ballot you know, going forward, that's the thing that was criticized by the, the uh, liberal justices because you, 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 know, you shouldn't be answering a question that wasn't asked. You know what I mean? That's the signal that they're covering for him a lot more. That's sure. the signal that this whole court is probably a sham and that they're not they're not, you know, ethical. And that's that's where we're really at. We're at with this right now. One comment before I get to the larger comment. This whole court's out of order and <laughs> never has that been more appropriate. It, it's true. Joking aside, Nick, what pisses me off about it? You know, it's one thing for Sotomayor, Kagan, and Brown Jackson to say, hey, this has gone too far, but also we're in agreement that a state can't do this. First things first, the 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 temerity of these people to say that Roe v. Wade is no longer law and the states should make up their minds about how to deal with abortion, and then to say that the states can't do this. I happen to think that that both of them are flawed rulings for the exact same reason. Because, you know, they, they, they're doing this ideologically. That's how this is being driven. And we've talked about this. How much work they're having to do to thread the needle to get the results that they want without giving away too much power, right? Here's the other thing about it. It would be one thing if these corrupted assholes would just own up to what they are. By the way, if I, if I ever see John Roberts again, I, I will go outside screaming. I'm so tired of this pencil pusher who wants to pretend like this court has any legitimacy. But guess who guess who showed up today and like put up big numbers like in in that club. That's okay. Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, and Amy Coney Barrett uh, her contribution to the opinion uh is going to go down in the history of the Supreme Court is one of the most like disgusting pieces of opinion writing. She wrote, "Quote, this is not the time to amplify disagreement." <laughs> with stridency. The court has settled a politically charged issue in the volatile season of a presidential election. Particularly in this circumstance, writings on the court should turn the na national temperature down, not up. She literally is trying to PR fix the, the opinion of the court. She's literally trying to frame it like, yay, I understand some of you people aren't going to enjoy this, but like, really, can we have some people write about this in the right way? Why can't anybody in this country own up to what they're doing? Why can't anybody in this country admit that they messed up? Why can't anybody in this country just go ahead and do what they want, ruin the systems that they want to ruin, and then just take their medicine when people write about them? Why are these people such crybaby assholes? Why can't they just sit with it? Right. It's amazing. It's people me. complain about getting canceled on a national TV show. It's incredible. As if they're being canceled in the moment. Uh, I always thought when fascism came, Nick, I always thought that it would be like, like, strong or something at least like you know disgusting like crushing of people with boots but my god these crybabies are unbelievable 
I, I hear you. I, it's interesting because it's probably their conscience trying to like leak out a little bit and just sort of scream out in the wilderness, help me. I, I have a conscience and, I, and I, it's being shoved down, you know, bleep, bleep. I got to tell you, any conscience that Amy Coney Barrett had, uh, it leapt out and ran and, and rode the rails years ago is what it did. I, 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 I knew this was probably how this thing was going to play out. And I got to tell you, before we get on to this next segment, Nick, I, I'm looking around at people they are they still believe that the institutions are going to save them they still think somehow or another like Kavanaugh is going to have a sleepless night and he's going to like you know look out the window longingly and 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 rule on the side of democracy that people really do not understand still that like this thing is not going to just go away that we can just hope that these people will take care of it for us it's just not going to happen that way um, I mean, it, at least you understand that. I, I think I understand that after the Mueller report and after everything else. So, um, yeah, we just have to get out and vote. We got to vote and we got to do a hell of a lot more than that. Speaking of the vote, Nick, um, the Republican primary is just about cooked. Uh, when you're listening to this, uh, Super Tuesday will be underway. That means Alabama, Arkansas, California, Colorado, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, and Virginia are all going to the polls. Uh, Trump is poised to sweep. Uh, after Nikki Haley won her first contest with D.C., which was basically just a bunch of lanyard wearing nerds who went out and voted for her, more or less. Uh, and now Trump is going to run this thing and probably by the end of the week, if not the end of next week, be in control of the Republican National Committee. And that will be it. Yes. As, as you refer to Lara, is it Lara? It's not Laura, right? It's Lara. It's Lara, I believe. Yes. Lara, Lara Trump gets to take over. Uh, the Maybe. I mean, that's not for sure, but probably right she's talking like she already is and she's already pledging all this different stuff and so um you know we'll see uh maybe that'll piss off enough enough people where it won't happen but um you know if ever there was enough if you if you weren't sure about like where the country is going or whether the legitimacy of the court is there or whether you know trump was uh sycophantically um you know uh corrupt then you know we uh, this is our our uh, our examples right here i do feel like um I had a funny, I had some, somehow a fever dream, you know, that Haley had won DC and I thought maybe in my brain it got messed up where I thought she was like ahead in Virginia or was winning Virginia, or was going to win Virginia. I missed something. No. I went to check the polls, Jared. You know what the if, polls are in Virginia? In Virginia? Yeah. Um, can I take a guess? I haven't looked. You can take a guess while I look it up. Is it Trump at like 75%? Yeah, 65. 65. And by the way, Haley would usually like overperform in a Virginia because that's where the military industrial complex is. And yeah. that's her people. And by the way, it's not 65, 35, it's 65, 16. <laughs> so, oh, that ain't, yeah. that ain't good. No. So, that you know, good. Listen, I guess it good, good for, good for Nikki to kind of, you know, dip her toe in the waters, feel how it's like, or it's, you know, move around a little bit in the space. And then, uh, you know, this, this is it. She's, she's wasting money at this point. I can't wait, by the way, for him to sweep Super Tuesday and for us to see one post on Twitter after another and one article in these magazines of repute that say he underperformed. I can't wait for more like people trying to explain like that we should not be worried about a, a Trump presidency. Uh, meanwhile, Nikki Haley, uh, the rumors are running wild that she is going to run uh, as an independent um, I've actually heard those same rumors from people within her campaign. I understand that you want to go in there and spoil this thing, but I don't think that's going to make any difference. On top of that, Nick, uh, Joe Manchin has now uh, dropped out of contention for being the No Labels Party member, which I think, by the way, means that Hogan could possibly be the nominee for them. I don't know. But uh, it feels like this cake is baked at this point, doesn't it? It, it feels like this thing is over. Uh, the general election is going to begin in March. Yeah, I'm not so sure she she can't be a spoiler. I mean, right? In a few couple in a couple states, if she can get you know twenty three thousand. Okay, points. but here's the thing, Nick: is there are, are Republicans going to play that game? Like, aren't are don't they understand that a vote for her would take away from Trump, and as a result, they wouldn't want to like give away power? Like, are there Republicans of conscience? You think that would vote for Trump otherwise? Well, no, but now it's only you're indicting Democrats who have done this in the past, who have voted for those third party candidates. To but the Democratic Party's different. Right. Okay. So that's, that's the difference. 
Uh, the Democratic Party will do all kinds of things, man. Yeah, I suppose, but there is a zealotry in the Republican Party too, and a and a fervor, and a so it's possible. But again, I'm I'm only talking about like the such tiny margins, which are very well, again, if it's ten thousand votes or twenty thousand votes in one of these states and whatever, like you know, if it ends up being something like that, then you know maybe. But I I'm here, I'm with you. I don't I don't I don't really feel like that's going to happen. Uh, and I like I said before, I get so frustrated with a lot of these uh, these campaigns because. They're, you know, the, the tens of millions of dollars they're going to spend is just wasted in my wasted. mind. And you know, not that they would put it in any better use, but it just, it just, it just makes me, you know, frustrated from a value standpoint. That like, it's just wasted. You might as well just light that money on fire. The entire system sucks. It sucks so bad, and it's such a, it, it really serves not much of a purpose outside of getting the same people wealthy is what it is like the same people have been benefiting from this for a very very long time uh so there it is that is our general election at this point it does not appear like the supreme court is going to take donald trump off of any ballot uh it doesn't appear that the states are going to have the power to do that uh obviously he is going to uh run roughshod over nikki haley uh but by the way nick before we even get into the general election i think sometimes we can lose sight of something Donald Trump has been convicted of sexually assaulting somebody. Donald Trump has been convicted of criminal fraud. Donald Trump is currently under investigation and trial and indictment for trying to overthrow the government of the United States of America, for trying to rig the election process in, in, in a state. Like, this is the nominee of one of the major two parties, and it's not even close. He dominated the entire primary process, ruined careers, and establishment Republicans has effectively taken over uh, one of the two major parties in the main superpower in the world. And look at what he is. It's 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 really um, it, it it's really amazing when you look at it. It's really really amazing. What's more amazing to me is this this fantasy that like in 2024 there are voters out there. Who haven't decided who they would vote for? Now, if, now, I had said this in 2004 again when it was Bush versus um, uh, Kerry. Oh Kerry, and uh, I couldn't understand it then either. But I guess I probably can now, looking at what we have today. Um, who are these voters? Who are these people who are like, yeah, I kind of like Trump. He's pretty cool. We know Biden. You know, I, I like some of his policies too. How, who is this? Is that a real person? Is it? They're, they're, um, it's, it's like trying to find Sasquatch is what it is. And they, they are, they are, the American voter in general is pretty terminally confused. The, the, the undecided voter in 2024 is pretty, pretty confused, I think. By the way, I, we should do, uh, look, I, I would go with you to the Ozark, or not Ozarks, to the Northwest, Pacific Northwest and try and find Sasquatch. Uh, that is an obsession of mine. And I would love to figure out whether or not he exists. He, he doesn't. Ex he doesn't exist. You sure? I don't even know. We no, he doesn't exist. Seen... Nick, we got it. <laughs> we can't argue about that. Leather Nimoy told me about it in, in search of in 1977, and I believe it. But um, I have, um, I have something for you. Um, where is this? I, I, I took a little thing where there are um, there are voters who voted for Biden in 2020 who are now going to switch their vote to Trump. Sure. Who are those people? I can't follow that at all. I think they are people. And, you know, you you, you read these articles. Uh, we're going to talk about one of the, the big polls that came out that actually has some heft to it. You read these people, Nick, and they are perpetual change voters. They're so pissed off about what's going on in this country. And they just always believe that whatever the alternative to what is happening, like they they, they do this. I mean, there's going to there are going to be. I'm not going to say that millions, but I am going to say at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Americans who voted for George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Biden, and are going to go back to, to Trump now. That's that's they're going to be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Americans who did that. Um, are drugs involved? Is this, are these people like, no, they, ju they, just, they, they, they literally, they're just perpetually pissed off at the status quo, which make in a way it makes sense. If you're not, if you're not keyed in politically, like 
and all you are is you're alienated from power. And quite frankly, you should be pissed off at the status quo right now. Like it can at least start to make sense. But like when you actually start looking at the the specifics of the the candidates, like it's 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 pretty harrowing. Right. And so it's like at this point, these campaigns need to target, you know, people and, you know, voters and um, like, for instance, well, we're going to get to Michigan. Well, we'll get to Michigan. Right? Well, we're going to get to Michigan in just okay. a second. Um, before we do, Nick, let's just go ahead and, and set up what we heard from the New York Times Siena poll, which is a, a pretty reliable poll. Uh, it came out Trump 48, Biden 43. 47% of the country currently strongly, strongly disapproves of Biden's job. Twenty, Only 25%, one in four, believes that the country is in the right direction, uh, which I can't believe it's at 25%. It, it, it should be a lot lower than that. Uh, Trump has higher marks on basically every major category, economy, safety, you name it. Uh, this is a rough poll. And, uh, you know, I, I keep seeing these people are like, New York Times, why are you running this? And it's like, one, New York Times is not your friend. Number two, like, this is the results of a poll. I'm sorry that it pierces your bubble of reality. Uh, but as this race is starting to take shape, this is not a good start. Oh, I got a quote from this article. Can I, can I read it? Do it. Both Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden are unpopular. Mr. Trump. Great. <laughs> Mr. Trump had a weak 44% favorable rating. Mr. Biden fared even worse at 38%. Among the 19% of voters who said they disapproved of both likely nominees, an unusual large co unusually large cohort in 2024 that pollsters and political strategists sometimes call double haters, Mr. <laughs> Biden actually led Mr. Trump 45% to 33%. Now, this is interesting. So you have these double haters, right, who, um, who, both, who disapprove of both of them. Um, and but Biden actually is more popular among them. And that might actually indicate who's going to win this race. I, I, I just hope that the, my double haters will soon become my double waiters at my table of double success. That that's incredible. Uh, double haters. And by the way, I uh, let's be frank, Nick. Nobody likes the boss. You know what I mean? Like no one, no one likes the current president. It's, it's like being the man speaking of, uh, you know, uh, 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 New York City. Like it, nobody likes the mayor. Nobody likes who's in charge because things aren't good and they're getting worse. Like it makes sense that Biden would have less than that. But also, I, I'll just say this, Nick. I lived in a very small rural college town in Georgia for a decade. I was telling somebody about this the other day. I got food poisoning at every restaurant in the city, you know, and multiple times. There was really. The, you, you, there weren't enough of places, right? But I'll tell you what, I'll be damned if I went back to eat at a place to get me food poisoning like the next night. Mm -hmm. You know, at least I waited a little while to let the stink get off. Like, it, it's incredible that people still want to go back here. The disadvantage that Biden has, though, is that he can have this asshole Trump just railing on him and lying about everything he's done in terms of his performance. And everybody that's following Trump will believe that. So we constantly see the man on the street interviews of Trump followers, right, of Trump supporters. Sure. And it's kind of sad and heartbreaking because they will spew all this, these, these unreasoned thoughts and these lies and whatever that Trump has just said. And I think maybe it's possible that in the past, when an incumbent is running against someone who's challenging him, the challenger didn't lie like this, I don't think, as much or as, as you know, as, as, uh, as well as Trump can do it, right? And so that's the real problem that that the built in disadvantage is that Biden can't seem to deal with uh, the fact, you know, or I don't know if anybody can. Uh, this guy who's just out there lying and everything that's, that he's done, he projects on the Biden and everyone seems to just assimilate it into their brains and believe it. And then that's and then it's done. And now Biden gets these low approval ratings and, you know, it mixes with everyone's brain. And, and, uh, and, and I don't know how he's supposed to combat that. Well, I think, first of all, you're you're right that Trump uh, is is not at all fastened by reality or the the limits of of decorum, right? I mean that in the past, like you would watch a you'd watch political rivals go after each other, but they would still do it with like a, a measure of decorum. They would still be like, you know, you may not uh, may not agree, but blah 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 blah. Like that's not what's happening here. But there's also a problem with this, and this is, again, one of the, the really, really dangerous poisonous elements. There's an element of truth in all of this, which is that it doesn't matter who the president is at the moment. The country is getting worse, right? Like things are declining in this country. Now, is it getting a lot more worse, which is what would happen with Donald Trump? 
Like it would accelerate with Donald Trump. It would be a whole lot worse if Donald Trump was president right now. And if he wins the office again, there is a natural momentum to it. So as a result, to go out and say, you know, these idiots don't know what they're doing and everything's getting worse. Well, technically, a lot of that's true. Like things are getting a lot worse and a lot of people don't necessarily know what they're doing in this situation. So it does sort of like coagulate. It also doesn't help that there are a lot of things that Biden has screwed up on. There are a lot of things that they haven't communicated about well. And it just so happens that he's captaining a ship that uh, is currently taking on a lot of water. And so as a result, the guy who's screaming, you know, absolute insanities, like, yeah, it's it's going to catch purchase with some people. And this is, I believe this. I, 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 I truly believe that we are probably in a situation where Trump is somewhere between five and eight points ahead of Biden right now, where this where this stands right now. Right. And if you look at any kind of historical data, the incumbent being that far down at this state of the, of it's, the year, it's it's, you know, over. Now, again, you can also then say that nothing we can't no. use any precedent in the past to predict what's going to happen this year, which right. I hope is true. But, um, you know, the weird thing is that oh, some of the fundamentals are not bad. You know, the, the typical fundamentals about like how, you know, inflation has gotten better. Um, you know, unemployment is very low. The stock market is very high. Um, you know, uh, the unions are stronger. Like th there are things, but but no one seems to want to either admit it or feel it or whatever, or they let the other outside forces that may be a little bit less of their control really just sort of dictate their mood on everything. And um, I, I think all that's true, but it's also the old measures of success have become increasingly decoupled from the measures of success for Americans. Right. Like the average American outside of the fact that their 401k and retirement are linked to the stock market like that, that doesn't mean anything to them. The stock market and the economy are just measures of how well they're being exploited. I mean, people know that things are getting worse. They can feel it. They can see it. They can live it. And on top of that, it's like not it's not like Joe Biden can wave a magic wand and suddenly reverse all of this. It would take a transformative presidency is what it would take. It would, it would take a movement, the likes of which are, are not currently there. I happen to believe that they could be there. But they're currently not. Now, Nick, we, uh, we we need to talk about the State of the Union and a couple of the things in terms of what Biden can do and how these things are taking place. Um, we're going to be, again, recording this episode live after the State of, State of the Union on Thursday. Um, I have my thoughts on what this needs to be and what it could be going into it. And and again, we're we're basically looking at the beginning of the general election race here. What do you what do you think this needs to be? What do you think it needs to do? Well, the weird thing is that foreign policy ends up coming up. The only thing that comes to my mind about talking about these things. I mean, I already mentioned he'll probably do all the usual usual uh, shoulder padding, self shoulder padding, I suppose, um, on the things like he'll say things about, you know, uh, in, in inflation coming down uh, in, in unemployment, stock market. He'll say all that kind of stuff. And again, it probably won't resonate with the average or normal almost anybody else in America. Uh, but the, the the foreign policy things, I think, are what would be an opportunity for him to start to reverse some of the trends that have been weighing him down. So I, I, I think what he should do is basically say, we will, starting tomorrow, we will not send any more missiles to Israel. And as soon as this is over, we pledge to rebuild Gaza for all the you know innocent Palestinians who are there to, to rebuild their lives. And, 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 you know, we pledge whatever amount of money to help rebuild Gaza. I think those two things would probably go a long way politically toward helping him uh, get some sort of footing on that uh, on that issue that has seemed to be dragging him down. Well, so for the people who maybe haven't seen this because, you know, it doesn't get reported all that much, uh, the, pro the Democratic primary in Michigan was rough, really, really rough. Biden won it, but 18 percent of, of the, the people who showed up to vote in this primary voted uncommitted. And I, I've talked about it on this podcast. Um, one of the things that um, po uh, politicos have been talking about behind the scenes, and I mentioned it before, is that Michigan's in like real danger of, of just being an automatic uh, Republican win in the general election. Uh, in large part, it's because of how the Biden administration has handled the situation in Gaza, which, by the way, uh, has been an absolute shit show and an embarrassment and a stain on this presidency. Uh, immediately after this 18% in Michigan, which was a, a warning shot over the bow, 
uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, went to Selma, Alabama uh, at the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge and uh, made some news by uh, saying, saying this, Nick, I, I believe you have the clip. The immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. Hamas claims it wants a ceasefire. Well, there is a deal on the table. Now, Nick, I, I, I want to hear from you in a second why you think Harris was the one uh, to, to make this announcement. Uh, on top of that, I want to talk about like what this means for the State of the Union and what you just said in terms of like, you know, sort of showing a tough face to Israel, which is something I think we need to discuss. But before we do, I just want to point out the rhetorical maneuvering that needs to be done here. Right. The war in Gaza is tremendously unpopular. Uh, especially among Democrats, for that matter, who who oppose this thing. They want a ceasefire to happen. The, the Biden administration has tried all kinds of communication strategies uh, saying, you know, we don't want this, but Netanyahu's a madman. We can't do anything about it. Meanwhile, we need to send them more weapons. It's been disastrous and embarrassing. Um, but you'll notice now what, what Harris had to do here was sort of, again, thread the needle. We need a ceasefire. The onus is on Hamas. Right. In order to try and do both things at this point. And the question is whether or not that gets landed. Um, and, and why do you think she was the messenger here? I have thoughts, but yeah. I mean, I think that they're just um, A-B testing here. They they already had dropped the leak of uh, Biden calling Netanyahu an asshole, I think was the word, or whatever it was. Oh, they've dropped all kinds of leaks. I mean, if, if, if it's to be believed, I mean, that he is not very fond of that Netanyahu fella. Yeah. And then the, those, you know, this has been a pretty good uh, discipline of White House in a way that that, that didn't leak uh, by accident. And here's another like, you know, let, we got to find out how this is going to pull. Like, we'll let Kamala do it because, we, you know, they obviously don't care that much about her and her position in the, in the White House. Right. I don't think I'm talking out of turn here. So I think this is all just the groundwork to find out what the what the response is going to be and how far they can go in a state of the union or another speech a, a, a week later or an interview he does um, to, uh, to to ultimately commit to doing something to put more pressure on Israel. Now, you have to remember, if he's, they don't send missiles anymore, um, it's not like Israel can't buy missiles from a host of other people across the world, right? They can buy bullets from anybody else as well. It doesn't necessarily mean it stops anything. But politically, uh, it's it's the, the the thing that will that will help them the most is just to be able to distance themselves from what's going on there, um, and and what is dragging their numbers down. So first things first, I think you're exactly right in terms of testing to see how this message goes over. Um, also, if it's not very popular, you, you said this White House is disciplined in terms of leaks. The the biggest leaks from this administration have been leaks saying that Kamala Harris is terrible. <laughs> like that, that, that has been one of the main things that the, the Biden administration wants to talk about. They have tried to foist all of their struggles on Kamala Harris, right? That they, there's not a major publication that they haven't sold that story to multiple times. On top of that, I think there's also a, a rhetorical strategy that's happening here, which is, you know, Kamala Harris, like you want to worry about Biden's age. That's totally fine. You want to think he's out of touch when it comes to Israel and Gaza. Just remember that Kamala's there. Just remember there's someone younger and maybe she gets it, right? Like there's a little bit of jujitsu that's happening in terms of expectations, I think. And on the subject of Israel and Gaza and the State of the Union, first things first, Nick, I, I, I think we should cut off weapons to, to Israel and I think we should have done it a while back. Um, you know, the fact that we have been complicit in this ethnic cleansing while meanwhile saying, man, we've been talking to Netanyahu and he just won't do it. Netanyahu should be in the Hague period. That That's the end of the story there. And on top of it, like, I'm sorry, do you, do you have the ability to stop this or are you too weak? And why is either one of those a better rhetorical political strategy? They both suck. But the question is, and you, I think you're right, by the way, I think the State of the Union has to have something splashy in it something that gets headlines. And most Americans don't give a shit about the State of the Union. They can't, they'll they read the paper the next day. They'll read the headlines the next day. But, you know, most people aren't like, oh, man, what was in the fourth graph? You know, how did he do this? I think Biden, first of all, has to give a speech where he doesn't fumble his way through it. 
if he fumbles his way through it, the narrative about his mental and cognitive abilities are just going to go through the roof. And by the way, you and I both know this and everyone listening. He's not good at giving a speech. He's just not. And so that's going to be interesting. But also, you need to say something about Israel and Gaza that changes the fundamental stance on this entire thing. So it's the thing that we can talk about the day after and move forward with. And the Democrats better get their shit together because they have been wrong on this thing. They have been absolutely fundamentally wrong. And you have to do something that shows something going forward. And it probably wouldn't hurt, Nick, to have a little bit of ambition in this speech that tells, like, Okay, give give this guy four more years. What's he going to do with it? Mm-hmm. And 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 we don't have an answer. I I, I would think it's uh, it should also be added that you know the Hamas leadership should be in the Hague uh, alongside Netanyahu as well. We can't. Well, I, I mean, they're, you're not going to find the Hamas leadership. You know, I mean, well, you're gonna... they're they're just having you know a good time you know in some nice building and away from all the fighting. So, uh, you know, we we can we lest we forget that they still have hostages. They still are, you know, are a terrorist organization like that, you know. Okay, why do you have to? Okay, I'm sorry. Why do you have to both sides this at this point? Everybody understands that what Hamas did was shitty and awful and shouldn't have been done. Why does every criticism of Israel have to be met with look at what Hamas did? Like, it's not not the same thing. Well, I I don't understand why. Well, I think that because it's not said. I I I don't think that part is added to it where that is never where they're there. The reason why we're in this predicament now is because Hamas did a ridiculous, horrible atrocity. Well, yeah, but does that mean you have to destroy every hospital and university and meanwhile mow down hundreds of people trying to get no, food? No, but, but And also, you know, they're the ones who, are, who, who intentionally put their own people. Well, OK, in- OK, but you're we're going in circles here. I don't like. The, the point of this is it's gotten out of control, period. It was never in control in the first place. Like, I, I understand that, like, we have to, like, sit here and say that Hamas did something awful. But at the same time, we can't be complicit in this. This is I, I'm sorry, but this is a really disgusting thing that the Biden administration has been a part of. Well, I, yeah, and those it just did won't be true. I, I, I agree. I, I agree with exactly everything that you're saying. And I also want to make sure that, you know, the people who are behind the attack, what they did, it needs to also. Well, know, yeah, I, I would listen. I am the hostages that Israel hasn't killed already. I would love for them to be released. And by the way, that's not at all what Netanyahu and anybody around him is interested in. I mean, they, they, they have they have not shown any sort of good faith in any of that. I want all of them released, the ones who survive. I, I would love for this ceasefire to take effect and for this peace to happen. But by the way, unless Biden puts his shoulder to the wheel in some way or another, like I don't see in any way, shape or form the way any way that this calms down. And for the record, I think Biden has been so weak on this thing that at this point, if he says we're not going to send them weapons anymore, like the narrative has already gotten away so bad. Netanyahu can just be like, oh, look, look at America, our great friend. You know what I mean? Like it, at this point, even to like get aggressive with it, I feel like it's been so out of the box that there's no putting it back in. It's oh, uh, maybe I, I think that I also do think that if he did that at the state of the union and said they weren't going to send any more weapons, it would be a, po- a political positive for him. I think I think it would be. What do you but, think? Um, what do you think the Republicans would do? You mean if, if it was a Republican president having a state of the union? No, if Biden says this is this is the situation, we're not going to send any more weapons to Israel. Like, can you imagine? I mean, for that matter, it wouldn't just be the Republicans. John Fetterman would lose his shit. Like, right. it would be a scene. It would it yeah, would be a scene. Also probably connected to to um, Ukraine as well. Stop sending it to Ukraine as well. But um, here's here's another mistake I think that the White House made. Uh, there are going to be relatives of the hostages uh, invited to the State of the Union, but not from the White House. It's from uh, a smattering of Republican and Democratic. I groups. hadn't read that. Oh, my God. And so I think that that would be I think that's a mistake. I think that at the, at the very least, the White House should have been the one spearheading that to continue to accentuate whatever that, that the point of that is, which uh, I'm not even exactly sure. I mean, solidarity, I suppose. But um, that's another one. That I think political mistake that they, that they missed out on. I just want to say, because, again, we're going to be doing our analysis immediately after the State of the Union. Nick, what we're talking about, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, 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 I honestly, what we have seen out of Biden, what we've seen out of the Democrats, what we've seen out of the response, it's all mealy mouth bullshit. It's just trying so hard to not really talk about it, to just sort of like, 
hope and pray. I, I'm sorry, but I thought him eating an ice cream cone with Seth Myers and talking about a ceasefire that should be done by Monday. And by the way, it's not done. Like, I, I think it sucks. I, I, I don't think that they've handled this the right way. I don't think they've messaged it the right way. And I don't think the State of the Union is going to be some sort of a showcase for a restart. You know, we're talking about what needs to happen, but I don't have faith that will. Do you? Uh, well, I mean, well, I guess we'll, we have the a choice between the, the eating ice cream and calling for uh, no more weapons to Israel. I, I don't know. I have, I, I Can you think, believe you just said that out loud? If it's going to be somewhere in between, like I'm trying to figure out what's in between uh, there that's like some mealy mouth, you know, half-assed version of that. Well, we're going to eventually stop sending missiles and we're going to eventually tell them this, they should stop, you know, have, have this ceasefire. I mean, what is the middle ground at that point that would be probably the more likely scenario here because, uh, other than what I propose? I can't believe you. And, and you're not wrong. You literally have to find the middle ground between eating an ice cream cone and taking a stand. Like that's that's where we're at. That's lame. That's right. lame as shit. I'm sorry. It just is. Uh, what would that be? Because I'm interested now if we can predict where he's going to end up. What what he's really going. I'll I'll, I'll I'll tell you what I think is going to happen. I think it's going to be a punt. I think he's going to take a strong stance on Ukraine. We have to help the the freedom fighters in Ukraine fighting for democracy. I think he'll probably say something that like sort of both sides the situation in Gaza while talking about conscience. I'm sure something along those lines. Uh, and then meanwhile, I mean, I think he's going to highlight some of his achievements, but like, do you know of anything that's in the works right now? Do you know of like any major plans that have been put on the table in terms of any of this? They've talked about protecting Roe, but they haven't put anything forward. There's nothing really on the table that way. There's no agenda that has been told to me that they're going to push for. Do you know of anything? I mean, when you get to Super Tuesday in the primaries, I don't think, uh, as a as a, as a matter of campaigning, they nothing gets done from this point on, right? Well, it should though. Isn't that what I you're know, supposed to be doing? Like, isn't this like this? This should become a, de a dead period for the White House. Like, they, you know, nothing is going to be proposed. You're not going to, you know, they have to keep. By the way, they have to keep funding the government. Like, He's down. What's that? He's down. No, I know. I mean, you listen, don't want to run out the clock when you're down. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I would be, but again, I, wouldn't we, would we be surprised if, if nothing, no legislation gets passed between now and November? Oh, absolutely. Unless like a major corporation needs bailed out. No, nothing's going to get passed. Right. You know, all, all, the only thing they worry about right now is keeping the government functioning uh, and getting the budget uh, done. And that's, uh, again, the, talking about kicking the can. So, um, and, and that wouldn't be necessarily weird compared to like all the other times we've seen races. But that's time. the whole point is how bad it is. It's, it's, it's not yeah. functional. But where, where do we end up on the whole, like if he should be replaced or not Biden? Well, I, I would, at this point, I don't think it matters. I, I I've said that I don't think he's the right guy for the time, but he's not going anywhere. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Listen, I, I'm just going to say this, you know, I, I, and I, I don't know, like, you look at how things are right now. Everything you just said is exactly right, Nick. At, but there's a problem. There's an issue here that isn't being taken care of. And what do you do when you get to an election? Like a lot of people, like you double haters. I'm going yeah. to eat dinner tonight and I'm going to be between bites of dinner. And just the word double hater is just going to be <laughs> rattling around. Like, what do you do at that point? What do you think this speech is going to be? What do you expect out of it? You know, it would be awesome if he did uh, at least remind us all about Roe v. Wade and how important that is. And I imagine he'll have some words to that. But I think what you want him to do is let's start to work on legislation to codify that so it doesn't get taken away completely across the entire United States. Um, that would help. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would only hope that he doesn't present as a feeble old man who trails off on every other sentence. That would be something. Um, which is possible, right? It's possible he can get through it if it's a 30 minute speech or whatever, but you're right. It's probably going to go long and he'll have to struggle with that. Um, but that's probably my only thing I can hope for at this point, because again, we know he's not going to do much besides what you described already, the platitudes and stuff for, for uh, Ukraine. He'll do some sort of like historical notion of our, our partnership with Israel and how we support each other. Sure. And our friends. He'll throw that out there, whatever gold in the ear. I'm sure he'll mention meeting her or something like that. And um and I, and I imagine he'll also say some nice things about Gaza and, and maybe some notion of like wanting to rebuild or like, you know, re, reconnect with that that segment of the population. But here's the problem about the Michigan thing is 
even though the people that voted um, not committed uh, for him, that is ominous, it doesn't really affect what they think of the numbers in, in the general for him. So that there is less an incentive there. They did, it didn't put the kind of pressure I think they were hoping for. But they, but it's a message. It's, it's a message, which is you need to work for my vote. Right. And Hillary already learned this about Michigan, right? And well, it, that's the entire see. point. Like the stranglehold over Michigan was not a stranglehold. Right. So it looked like what I'm sure it looks like to the Biden administration, too. And in, and for right now, like we could scoff and say or, or just dismiss that. But, yes, that could grow. You know, that could metastasize, become a real problem for them um, and probably as it should. And so, they, you know, they better not make that same mistake that Hillary did uh, in Michigan, for instance. Because You better is- hope you better hope that there's a position that Gretchen Whitmer is interested in in, in your administration. Like you, you better hope that you can somehow or another get her interested in like really working her ass off going into November. And I'm sure she That's would it. offer a cabinet position. I'm sure she would take it. But, man, this sucks. I, I really, as somebody who has studied this and seen this thing, like coagulating and coming together, man, and fomenting, I, I wish I felt better about this right now. I, I wish like hell that this felt better. There, the choice between anybody and Donald Trump is so obvious at this point. You know what I mean? Like, it, listen, I hate that like what you said is correct, which is the best that we can hope for at this point is that the sitting president of the United States who is asking for four more years in office can make it through a speech without yeah. like exposing awesome. himself, basically. Mm-hmm. Like that's that sucks. And then on top of it, you have this like uh, this albatross around his neck with with Gaza. You you have like uh, one of the main states that he needs, which are is not interested. The Supreme Court is like doing all this. I just want I want to feel better than this. I do. I, I agree. I, I want to feel better. I'm trying to think out when did I last feel good <laughs> in general about about this. I mean, I think maybe Clinton. At some point, I felt like, you know, I, I feel like there, there's a lot of smart people in the administration, the smarter than me, who are going to be able to make good decisions. But I mean, I think I felt that. I don't know if it was true, but I might have had that feeling somewhere in the mid 90s. I was excited when Obama won and I was so frustrated that, you know, it's like watching your favorite team play with their hands tied behind their backs. Like in realizing how much like the hope and change message was uh, a, a slogan, you know, and a sales pitch that that really bothered me. And then all of a sudden, like you know, for a lot of the neoliberalism, just to uh, you know continue and even get worse. Like I, I I felt better for a while, and then I was just frustrated. And this watching Trump as an existential threat, and again, he's a he, he's a symptom of a larger disease. Watching this stuff come together is just and and watching the people make the same mistakes nick i saw something the other day on twitter somebody who's like i hope the supreme court rules that he has total immunity and then biden will be able to do this this and this and it's like people have lost the thread you know like they really truly have yeah but that is an interesting case though by the way if trump gets absolute immunity that kind of means that that so does biden and do uh, you want that people are celebrating that idea yeah, I mean, it kind of backfires in a way, which is why they shouldn't do it and they won't do it. Like, I, I'm willing to go on record saying they will not give an absolute immunity. That's well, that's a, that's a that's a horse of a different color. But also, like, if you really think that the only thing holding Joe Biden back is the idea of prosecution, that's the only reason he can't get the agenda you want done. Like, I don't know what to tell you. And it just, Nick, I, I, it's just the lack of seriousness in this country and the lack of urgency. And I, I talk to I talk to Democratic consultants all the time and like. So many of them are pulling their hair out. Others are way too delusionally uh, overconfident. And I just, I don't know, man. I hate that we're sitting here in early March and it feels like this. This is this is shitty. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 something is going to have to happen. Uh, something positive that needs to happen between the next several months that can galvanize everybody. Obviously, you know, the only thing that can happen would be that they, that they pick somebody you know, younger and, and more energetic to run. But uh, I, I don't know. I think there's there's some paradigm changing things that can happen, but but we shall see. All right, everybody. A reminder this Thursday, uh, State of the Union, 9 p.m. Eastern is when it begins. These things. I was so shocked, Nick, when we talked about this, when we were talking about how long we thought Biden would go for. And like most states of the union or would it be state of the unions or states? It's states of the union, right? State plural. 
No, because it's the State of the Union. So it's, it is the State of the Union, uh, you know. So the actual, State of the Unions? Yeah, I don't know. State of the Union addresses. It's like, it's like a, the plural of attorney general is attorneys general. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's that. It's one of the yeah, wild ones. You know you're talking about. Anyway, and it was like, wow, Biden's only been going for about an hour, which is, that's quick. That's quick in State of the Unions. Thank God. I'm sure you you ain't kidding. If you're giving a speech over an hour, like you're doing something wrong. Uh, but we will be uh, reacting to it, analyzing it immediately after. Go over to patreon.com slash podcast. Join in and all the good fun. We look forward to seeing everybody for the live weekender taping. In the meantime, you can find Nick at Can You Hear Me? Yes, you. Find me at J.Y. Sexton. Be safe out there.